When I began teaching seven years ago, I was ecstatic to be in my own classroom teaching kindergarten. I spent the summer before the first year thinking about how I was going to set up my room. I would occasionally stop in the classroom over the summer to bring in all the materials that I had collected over the years. And I sat down to jot down a few ideas about the first few weeks of school. And then I panicked. I had a rush of questions going through my mind. What am I going to teach? What's the designated curriculum for kindergarten? Do I have to write detailed lesson plans? And the list of questions goes on and on and on. So let's just say I had many sleepless nights over that summer. But then I finally stopped and asked the question, what have I been learning about teaching from the Art of Teaching program? When I stopped to, thinking, to think about teaching as an art, instead of panicking about teaching as a rote process, I calmed down a little. Not a lot, but a little. Now that I'm looking back on it, I realize that even before my first day in my own classroom, I started to rely on the tools that I had learned from the Art of Teaching program. During the program, we spent a lot of time reflecting about our own learning and thinking of our strengths as a learner. This active reflection, together with the descriptive review process, has had a profound effect on my life as a graduate student, or sorry, had had a profound effect on my life as a graduate student in the program, and certainly on my teaching journey. So as I panicked about the first few days of school and how I was going to be a successful teacher, I had to trust in what I had learned about myself, as well as the powerful knowledge that I had gained through the descriptive review process. As we all know, taking time to observe a child is how you complete this process. Therefore, my entire journey so far, in my entire teaching journey so far, I really have realized that observation is the key element that I hold on to in my teaching practice. Observation gives me insight into what a child truly is interested in. I learned very quickly that no matter what I had planned for each day or month or week or year, I had to make room for a child walking through my door holding onto a flower that they had just picked on the way to school, or another child who brought in a, book, a favorite book that they wanted me to read that day. My teaching is constantly changing based on who is walking in the door each day. Observations guide my teaching of individual skills, which speaks specifically to a child's modes of thinking and learning. So when the big word that we all hear of differentiation is thrown around, I think in my mind that if I teach to a child's strengths and skill base, which I have learned through my observations, I am already differentiating my instruction. Observation shows me where a child can take risks and where he or she needs to be supported. I find this applies to a child's learning as well as their social development. I mention social development because I feel that social and emotional growth is often overlooked and is, it is a very much a part of the typical day in kindergarten. How a child approaches social relationships is an important element in kindergarten and parents often ask me, who does my child play with or do they play alone or are they making friends? So taking notes about friendships and how a child connects with others helps me when having those conversations with parents. The descriptive review has taught me that there is an art in making observations and in not making conclusions. In order to hold on to key elements or headings of the descriptive review process, I've created a binder to keep my notes. Each child has his or own, her own section, and the descriptive review headings are neatly arranged in five little boxes on the page. When I have the time to scribble a few notes, I'm always asking myself the important question tied to the descriptive review process. Am I being respectful of the child? never writing anything as a negative, but rather stating what a child is, is doing. For example, I might write, Scarlett watches others as she works. Instead of writing, Scarlett is unable to complete her work because she's easily distracted by others. <laughs> <laughs> this note taking of my observations also helps me when writing detailed conference reports for parents. At the end of the year, I'm required to fill out an achievement report for, this, for each child which essentially is a checklist of the curriculum skills that are, we're supposed to have, they, have, they are supposed to have acquired over the school year. I've quickly learned that the checklist doesn't even begin to express the knowledge that I have about each child and their abilities. Therefore, it's imperative to me that I share the information that I have gathered about a child in a much more comprehensive way. I share this information at my parent conferences and in written comments that I attach to that achievement report. And in fact, this year, I found myself starting all of my spring conferences, which happened in April, with the following statement. In June, you will get an achievement report about part of your child's kindergarten year. I would like to take this time to express to you all that I have learned about your child 
that doesn't appear on that report. Mm -hmm. Sharing these observations seems to be an aspect of my conferences that parents, that parents appreciate. This year in particular, I had a parent say, how do you possibly know this much about each child in your class? And another parent who was laughing as I described her child, and when I asked why she was laughing, she just said, you just described Ashley so well, that's exactly who she is. In kindergarten, much of the learning is happening through exploration of play and play, and very little evidence of, a of how a child spends their time in my classroom actually goes home to the parents. So in other words, I'm not, I don't send home any you know, workbooks or math sheets or homework assignments. Therefore, it's important for me to explain to parents all the learning that's happening in my room. So when a parent asks me why his child, Connor, is always coming home making paper, with paper airplanes, I can explain all the learning that he has gained through this exploration. For example, the process in which Connor has, how, how he has learned to make paper airplanes, the ability to create a plane on his own or follow an instruction book, the social understanding that Connor has learned about how to wait his turn when flying his airplane in the hallway <laughs> and following the rules about being safe when others are walking in the hallway. In addition, I can share with him how Connor has connected with other children in the room who also have an interest in making paper airplanes and how his role in making airplanes went from relying on others to uh, making, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> went from relying on others to make a plane for him to eventually having Connor be the one who's teaching a child about how to make a plane. If I didn't take the time to value and observe this work, I wouldn't be able to articulate the learning that's going on in my room, and therefore when, the, when a parent says to me, I know how he spends his work time, he makes paper airplanes, what else does he do? I can really explain what it is that he's doing. And lastly, observations help me to problem solve man classroom management issues as they arise. In order for me to create a respectful classroom environment where each child feels safe to take risks, both academically and socially, I need to rely on observations and reflections when thinking about such things as the layout of my classroom, daily transitions, rug spots if needed, and social dynamics when creating my extended day groups or partnerships. Over the last seven years, I've learned so much from the four, five, and six-year-olds six that have walked through my door each day. It is my goal to help keep, sorry, it is my goal to help each child highlight his or her strengths and skills and apply them to the world around them. It is invaluable for me to form a relationship with each child, to know how to support their learning, know when to challenge them, and to build an environment that fosters their individuality in the bigger classroom community. I've learned to trust that the time that I spend attending to a child's interests is much more powerful than the, than the time that I would have spent on a teacher-directed activity. Whenever I feel stressed or overwhelmed by classroom demands, I rely on my observations to guide me to a better place of understanding. Each year, there seems to be new demands added to our day, like assessments and a math or a literacy block, but somehow nothing ever seems to get taken away. Things are always added. So the precious time that I allow for open-ended exploration is always in question, and I have to have the courage to hold on to that time in my schedule. The majority of the observations that I make come during this work time. I learn about how a child moves around the room, which materials they choose to work with, how they approach something new, how they return to a material over time or not, how, do they, how they approach their friends, problem solve, share materials, invite others to help, and all of these aspects gives me insight into their personalities. I've also learned about the power of surrounding myself with colleagues that have a similar way of looking at, of children, at children and respecting the work that comes from their knowledge of the world. For the past seven years, I've returned to Sarah Lawrence each year and participated in the Saturday seminars. This opportunity allows me, allows me to return to my roots and values as a teacher. It's a place to have respectful conversations about children and our teaching practice and to hear about publications and articles that can support our teaching. I often use this information that I gather at these seminars to share with colleagues and parents. These conversations give me courage and support to trust myself and the time that I allow kindergartners to be kindergartners. And very often, Joyce brings in lots of different mediums of art and we get to play and mess around too. <laughs> I can honestly say that the Art of Teaching program has truly showed me that like all art, teaching is unique, always changing in the process and powerful, just like every child who walks in the door. <laughs>